I think that's the best introduction and welcome I've ever received when I got up to preach. I don't know, uh, I don't know what we're going to do Monday night and Tuesday night. I really don't. This thing seats 10,000 people, you know, when you kind of squeeze in together. We'll do the best we can. Second Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. Second Timothy chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. We read these words. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now drop down to chapter 4. Verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. In beautiful human language resplendent with divine revelation, the Apostle Paul sets forth the Bible's teaching concerning itself. Now it may help us to get a little bit of background right here. Paul, the older preacher, is coming to the end of his road and what a road it has been. It started on the Damascus Road, and it has gone all the way now to the dungeon of Rome. Timothy is the younger preacher, just beginning his road. And the older preacher wants the younger preacher to understand the importance of the book which he holds in his hand. And so in these closing words of the old preacher Paul to the young preacher Timothy, he wants to talk with him for a little while about the importance of the Bible and the necessity that he preach that word in the ministry which God has given to him. It is interesting to me that in verse 15, Paul refers to the Bible as the Holy Scriptures. And he says to young Timothy, from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures. What he's saying is, this is not a new book to you. You have known it all of your life. I think that uh, many of us in this service tonight can identify with that. The earliest memories of my life about the Bible came to me uh, in vacation Bible school. I can remember those days as just a little child, I would go into vacation Bible school. And sometimes it would be my opportunity to stand before the other students with a copy of the Bible in my hand. And after the pledge to the American flag and the pledge to the Christian flag, I would take a step forward and with trembling hands I would hold in my uh, hand a copy of the Bible. We would pledge allegiance to the Bible and then we'd sing songs like this, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. And then sometimes we would sing Holy Bible, Book Divine, Precious treasure, thou art mine. From a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Scriptures, it is an unusual word combination found only here in all of the Bible. 
The word for scriptures here is the Greek word grammata. It is not the word graphe, which is used in verse 16, nor it is, the, is it the word uh, lagos in chapter 4, verse 2. It is the word grammata, which means uh, the writings are the document. And then he says the holy writings, the holy documents, another unusual word. It is not the normal Greek word, hagias, for holy, but it is another word, hehera. It is used in one other significant place in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 13, where reference is made to the holy things of the temple. It is talking about those vessels and utensils in the temple, and they are called the hehera. They are called the holy things, the sacred things, things that had been separated for special uses of God. And so when Paul, writing to the young man Timothy about the Bible, wants to emphasize uh, the special reverence attached to this book, he calls it the Holy Scriptures. He sounds kind of like a Baptist, doesn't he, talking about the Bible. I heard about these three preachers, a Presbyterian and a Pentecostal and a Baptist, who were talking about what Paul's denomination might be if he uh, came back to earth. And someone said, uh, the, the, Pentecost, the uh, Presbyterian said, oh, I think he would surely be a Presbyterian because he would admire our scholarship. And the Pentecostal said, well, I don't think there's any question about it. If he'd be a Pentecostal, he would love our doxology and praise. The Baptist preacher didn't say anything, and so one of them looked at him and said, Well, what do you think he would be if he came back? He said, Oh, I don't think he'd change. <laughs> when, when you talk about the Holy Scriptures, you are talking Baptist talk. And I want to talk to you a little while tonight about a Baptist and his Bible. And in these verses, the Apostle Paul takes the young man and he takes us quickly to the counseling room. And then he takes us to the classroom. And then he takes us to the crisis room. First of all, he takes us to the counseling room and he shows us the intention of the Bible. He says in verse 14, continue in the things you have learned. That's continuation. And have been assured of, that is conviction. Knowing of whom thou hast believed them. And then he says, from a child, you have been able to know the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation, that is conversion. There we find the intention of the Holy Scriptures. There what we find what our Bible is intended to do. And the Apostle Paul is reminding young Timothy of the experience he had. Reminding him how that it was through the Holy Scriptures that he came to know the Lord Jesus as his Savior. You know, in my church when I was a boy, we had a Sunday school class known as the TEL class. I lived a lot of years before I understood that the TEL class, made up of the grandmothers in our church, represented uh, Timothy, Eunice, and Lois. You see, Timothy had a wonderful, wonderful advantage. He had a godly mother, Eunice, and he had a godly grandmother, Lois. And from a child, knowing of whom you have learned them. From a child, he had been taught the Holy Scriptures. I can almost imagine that Eunice and Lois, uh, day by day, would say, What Scripture shall we read for Tiny Tim today? And they would carefully select it. And one day they'd read about creation. And another day they would read about Noah and his ark. And another day they would read about uh, uh, Abraham placing his son on the altar on Mount Moriah. They were preparing his little heart. So that one day he might be wise unto salvation. And then on a day there was a man named Paul who came to preach at the First Baptist Church of Lystra. And he preached the gospel and he preached the simple story of salvation. And when the invitation hymn was given, young Timothy went forward and he gave his hand to the preacher and he gave his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was made wise unto salvation. And I can almost imagine that a deacon went home that day and around the lunch table somebody said, Did anything happen at church today? Well, he said, Not much. We had a long-winded preacher. And oh yeah, Eunice's boy Tim joined the church today. Not much happened. Not much. Here is the man who's going to be the traveling companion of the Apostle Paul and he just got saved. Not much. Here's the man to whom two books of your Bible were written. Not much. Here's a man for whom the angels of glory rejoiced and there was fruit basket turned over in heaven because another soul was saved. Not much. Ring the bells of heaven. There is joy today for a soul returning from the cold. He was made wise unto salvation. You know, that's exactly what the Bible's intended to do. 
In Psalm 19, verse 7, the Bible says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And in John chapter 20, verse 31, it says, What things uh, were, written, were written for our learning. And it says that, that you might know that Jesus is the Christ, and that believing you might have life through His name. You see, the, the purpose, the intention of the Bible is to make us wise unto salvation. You ever thought about how wise you have to be uh, to be saved? Well, first of all, you have to know you're a great sinner. And you see, this Bible confirms what our own experience screams in our heart because it is this Bible which says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It is this Bible which says there is none that doeth good, not one. You have to know, first of all, to be saved that you are a great sinner. But then also you have to know that God has provided a great salvation. And you find this in the Bible. And you have to know that God has provided this great salvation in the person of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible is a book which points to the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ is the theme of the Bible. The Bible says about itself in Acts chapter 10, verse 43, To Him give all the prophets witness that through faith in His name, whosoever believeth in Him might be saved. You see, this Bible is intended to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore bringing us to a knowledge of Him in salvation. You see, the Bible is a book which tells us about Jesus. In the Old Testament, He is anticipated. In the New Testament, He is announced. The Old Testament uh, predicts Him. The New Testament presents Him. If you want to know uh, about the stars, you read astronomy. But if you want to know about the bright in the morning star, you read the Bible. If you want to know about the ages of the rock, you read geology. But if you want to know about the rock of ages, you read the Bible. If you want to know about the roses and the lilies, you read botany. But if you want to know about the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley, you read the Bible. I find my Lord in the Bible wherever I choose to look. He is the theme of the Bible, the center and heart of the book. He is the rose of Sharon. He is the lily fair. Wherever I open my Bible, the Lord of the book is there. And so you see, when I realize that I'm a great sinner, and when I see in the Bible a great Savior, I understand that through faith in Him, I can have a great salvation. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. One of the reasons I have always loved the Sunday night service is because on a Sunday night, Joe, sitting right where you sit on the second row, I received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I have always been thankful that I was uh, a part of a church that had a Sunday night service and didn't close the doors. I have always been thankful that God gave me a pastor who preached the Word of God and told me that I was a sinner and told me that Christ died on the cross for my sins and told me that if I would turn from my sins and receive Jesus Christ into my heart and my life, I would be saved. And that night I heard an old, old story, how the Savior left from glory, how He gave His life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. And I did what Timothy did. I went forward and I gave my hand to the preacher and I gave my heart to Jesus and I walked out of that building and I had been made wise unto salvation. That's the intention of the Scriptures. And that's why we Baptists and that's why believers get all upset and out of joint when people start messing with the Bible. You see, to mess with the Bible is to is like uh, poisoning medicine for a dying man. It's like uh, polluting the bread of a hungry man. It's like uh, corrupting the water of a thirsty man. You see, it is this book which brings people to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And undermine the message of this book and you have done eternal damage to the souls of people. I heard about uh, the great preacher... Henry Ward Beecher, who was invited to attend the Atheist Club, presided over by Robert Ingersoll, the noted uh, agnostic. And so he went and he sat uh, uh, to listen to Ingersoll, who gave a blistering attack on the Christian faith and mocked and made fun of the Bible and everything holy. And after uh, Ingersoll sat down to thunderous applause, he looked over at uh, Beecher and he said, Would you like to say a few words in defense of the Bible? And Beecher rose slowly to his feet. And then he said, he said, you'll have to forgive me if I seem a little bit shaken. On the way to the meeting tonight, I, I saw something which shocked me greatly. He said, I saw a poor blind man standing on the curbside. 
He was walking on a cane, groping his way alone. And then he said, I, I saw a young lad come to assist him across the road. And about that time, a hulk of a man came and, and pushed the lad away and broke the man's cane and pushed the poor blind man in the mud and went on his way laughing. And there was silence in the room for a moment. And then Ingersoll jumped to his feet and his eyes were blazing and he roared. He said, the bully, do you know who he is? Do you know who he is, Beecher? Beecher said, yes, I know who he is. It's you, Ingersoll. He said, it is you. He said, man is poor and blind and he is groping. And little there is to lean upon and few there are to help him along the way. And what do you do, Ingersoll? You come along and you break his faith in the Bible. You push him in the mud and you go on your way laughing. You are the man, Ingersoll. Ladies and gentlemen, God have mercy on the man who will tamper with the book which makes us wise unto salvation. So he takes us, first of all, to the counseling room and he shows us the intention of the Bible. But then secondly, he takes us to the classroom and he shows us the inspiration of the Bible. Now we find ourselves in verse 16 in the classroom again. I often think when I hear uh, people like Dr. Patterson and when I hear people like Dr. Moeller, how wonderful it would be uh, to go back to the classroom again and sit at the feet of these wonderful scholars. We probably have 10 or 12 seminary professors who are in this conference, godly men who have paid the price and have studied and prepared themselves to teach young men uh, about the Word of God and how to preach the Word of God. Oh, God bless you, wonderful professors. God bless you, godly men. And, and uh, I think how wonderful it would be to be in the classroom again. But, but could we just for a moment, you and I go to the classroom, could we put on our thinking cap for just a moment? and go to the classroom, we do not come as scholars of the Bible. There are no scholars of the Bible. There are only students of the Bible. I do not come tonight as a teacher. I come tonight as a student trying to learn about the inspiration of the Bible. And in verse 16, we are given a very clear statement about the Bible's inspiration. It says in verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. I think that's about eight, eight uh, words, if I uh, counted correctly, in the King James text. It is actually three words in the Greek text. And the third word is a word, a uh, one word, which takes five words in the King James text to translate. It is the word theopneustos. And the word theopneustos is a compound Greek word built on the word theos, the word for God, and neo, the word for wind, or to blow. Putting it together, it becomes a verbal adjective, and it is used in the passive sense. And it simply is saying here, all Scripture is God-breathed. That God is the agent of the inspiration of the Bible. That God is the source of its origin, of its content, and of its nature. And so you see, when I come to the classroom, I learn that the Scripture is supernaturally inspired of God. This is no mere book. This is a book breathed by God Himself. When God scooped up the lifeless clay that was Adam and breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life and, and Adam became a living soul, that was creation. But in inspiration, God picked up the lifeless pages of man's manuscripts and breathed in them so that what we have is the living, breathing Word of the living God. Just like a little child picks up a seashell and puts it to her ear to hear the winds and the waves blowing in the seashell. We pick up a copy of the Word of God and in its pages we hear the blowing of the divine Spirit of God. The Bible is supernaturally inspired. Now this does not take away the human element in the Bible. There's some people who say, well, you, you believe in the inspiration of the Bible, the Holy Spirit it inspired it, it does away with the human personalities. And of course we know that it does not. When you read the Bible, you find human personality everywhere. When you read your Bible, you find the burning sarcasm of an Isaiah. 
and you find here the, the moving pathos of a Jeremiah. And in your Bible, you find the deep philosophy of a John. In your Bible, you find the crisp logic of, of, of a Paul. Amos writes like a farmer, and Peter writes like a fisherman, and, and Paul writes like uh, uh, the scholar that he is. If God wanted a selection of Psalms like David, he selects a, and prepares a David to write them. If he wants a series of letters like Paul's, he prepares a Paul to write them. There is a dual authorship in the Bible. 2 Peter 1, 21 puts it this way. Holy men of God spake. That's the human element. But it says, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That is the divine element. And so you see, the Bible is supernaturally inspired. But I want you to notice, not only is the Bible supernaturally, oh, which, by the way, that means to us then, that if the Bible is breathed by God, it means then that a perfect God has inspired a perfect book. A perfect God could not inspire an imperfect book. All Scripture is God-breathed, and God, ladies and gentlemen, does not have halitosis. His Word is divinely, accurately inspired. And that, that just simply means then that whatever the Bible teaches on any subject, it is accurate. The Bible is not a science book, but when it speaks on scientific subjects, it's scientifically correct. The Bible is not a history book, but when it touches on matters of history, it does so accurately and infallibly. If you cannot believe what the Bible says about Genesis, how can you believe what the Bible says? about uh, John 3.16. If you can't believe in the beginning God created, how can you believe for God so loved the world He gave His only Son? If you can't believe what the Bible says about creation, how can you believe what the Bible says about salvation? It's as if Jesus anticipated the debate that would go on in our century in John 3 verse 12 when He said, If I have told you of earthly things and you believe not, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? It is supernaturally inspired. That means every paragraph. That means every sentence. That means every line. That means every word. That means every letter. It is all God breathed. God breathed book. But ladies and gentlemen, the Bible is not only supernaturally inspired, the Bible is verbally inspired. The second word there is the word graphe, all scripture, graphe. You know the word. We get our word graphics from it. They put graphics up on these screens from time to time. It is the word graphe. It is the word graphics, and it means to write, and it has to do undoubtedly with the words. All scripture is God-breathed. Every word is God-breathed. That means that the words of the Bible are inspired. Now, when I went to school, they used to say to us, now, uh, you don't expect the words of the Bible uh, to be necessarily inspired. It is the thought. It, it is the thoughts expressed that are inspired, not necessarily the words. Now, I come from a little town up in Carroll County, Georgia. Uh, we may not have been the most brilliant people in all the world, but, but nobody ever has been able to explain to me how it is possible to have thoughts without words. Now, now, how can you have a thought without a word? You just try it just for a moment. Now, right where you sit, have a thought, but don't use any word. Now, you just sit right there, put it to the test, think something right now. Think something, but don't use any word. Now, what are you thinking? If you're thinking anything, there's some words attached to it. I, I, I heard about two Indians who were carrying on a conversation, and one said to the, to, to the other, Ugh. And this Indian said back to him, ugh. And this Indian said back to him, ugh. And this Indian said, ugh. And this Indian said, ugh, ugh. And the other Indian said, don't change the subject. <laughs> oh, listen. Listen, ladies and gentlemen. When you take the numbers off the page, the math disappears. When you take the notes off the page, the music disappears. When you take the words off the page, the words disappear. Did Jesus believe in verbal inspiration? Let's let him speak for himself. Turn over to Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. And in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, the Lord Jesus said these words. He answered and said, he is talking to Satan. He said in Matthew 4, 4, it is written... 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now add this corollary, Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, where it said, where Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Where do you find his words? Where do you find the words of inspiration? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13 says this. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 13, Which things also we speak. Not in words which man's wisdom speaketh, but which, which words God speaketh. You find the words of God in the Bible. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. It goes a little further than this. He not only believed the words were inspired, he believed more than that. Matthew chapter 5, and I want you to look at verse 18, the words of Jesus. It says in verse 18, For verily I say unto you. Now when Jesus says verily, that means he's fixing to say something very important. You better turn up your antennas. Verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Now he said one jot. Now a jot was a Hebrew letter. It was the Hebrew letter Yoth. It is the smallest letter in the Hebrew vocabulary. It is actually just a breath mark. For instance, back in the Old Testament when Abram was known as Abram, you remember that, Abram? And then his name was changed to Abraham. The only difference there is a yod, Abram. And then when the Spirit moved upon Abram, he became Abraham, a breath mark. Jesus said not one little breath mark will pass away until all be fulfilled. And then he said not only one jot, but he said one tittle. Now, what about a tittle? Do you know about a tittle? If you've ever had Hebrew, you know what a tittle is. A tittle is a little indention on a Hebrew letter about one thirty-second of an inch. It is just a little indention. Jesus is saying not one little breath mark, not one little indention, Nothing shall pass away until all my word be fulfilled. Verbal inspiration. I love the words of the Bible, don't you? All oh, that word salvation. All oh, those words of faith, hope, and love. All oh, that word grace. All oh, that word Jesus. What a name is the name of Jesus. The very words sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life. The Bible is, first of all, supernaturally inspired. Secondly, the Bible is verbally inspired. And then thirdly, the Bible is totally inspired. It says all Scripture. And it is the Greek word pasa. Pasa grafe theopneustas. All Scripture. Now the word all is a word that simply means that the whole and every part of the whole is inspired of God. Now that's where Baptists have always been. You know, we had a little struggle back in the 80s and into the early 90s. Uh, about whether all of the Bible was inspired or not, the historic position of Southern Baptists has always been that all of the Bible is inspired. And, and, and I said to them back then, and I repeat it, that, that I'm standing where Southern Baptists have always stood, and when they stand where they ought to stand, they'll be standing where I'm standing. I heard about an old guy named Jeb. Old Jeb and his wife were going to town one Saturday in the pickup truck. And his wife looked at him and said, You know, Jeb, when we married, we didn't sit this far apart. And old Jeb said, I ain't moved. <laughs> I'm standing where Southern Baptists have always stood. We believe in the total inspiration of the Bible. We believe the whole and every part thereof is equally inspired of God. Now, you know, at the turn of the century, an old thief silently crept into this land. This old thief had been over there in Germany robbing people of faith and robbing them of spiritual power and, and moral uh, uh, strength. And, and uh, this old thief made its way into the northern part of our country and began to move down the eastern coast. Depleting dom denominations and, and uh, killing denominations and, and robbing institutions of their faith and ripping the Bible from the hearts and the hands of the common people. And, and that old thief has been around a long time. It's an old thief. 
Uh, it first appeared in the Garden of Eden uh, where the, the Satan said to Adam and Eve in the Garden, Has God said, questioning the accuracy and the authority and the acceptability of Scriptures? And that old thief began to, to move in. And that old thief uh, is who I call destructive criticism. Destructive criticism which clips the wings of faith with the, the scissors of reason. Old destructive criticism which uh, submits the warm wonder of the Word of God to the cold merciless analysis of destructive criticism. And, and destructive criticism had a toolbox it brought with it and had some, had some uh, diabolical tools in it. Uh, in that box was a heretical hammer driving into the Bible the nails of the anti-supernatural and nails of anti-miraculous. And it had a, had, it had a, a, a skeptical saw uh, pulling the word from the Bible saying that the, the word of God and the Bible are separate things so that now the Bible is inspired in spots. But this spot is inspired, but that spot is not inspired. And now somebody's got to be inspired to tell you which spots are the inspired spots. And then there, it, it had a cynical crowbar ripping the Bible uh, from the hearts of the common people. But I am here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that conservative scholarship has risen to the occasion in our day and has demonstrated that old destructive criticism and all of its tools are, are flawed. You can't take the supernatural out of the Bible. You can't take the miracle out of the Bible. You can't kick God out of His Bible any more than you can kick God out of His universe. You, you say, Preacher, do you believe in the miracles of the Bible? Yeah, I believe in the miracles of the Bible. Preacher, do you really believe that a big fish swallowed Jonah? Yeah, I believe it. How he stood him, I'll never know, but I believe he did it. And Preacher, do you really, do you really believe that Daniel survived all night in a lion's den? I do. I believe when Daniel went down there, he used uh, the, the warm mane uh, of, uh, of the lion for a pillar and used the tail to swish the mosquitoes off. And the next morning when the king came down to see if he was alive, old Daniel said, Yep, I'm doing fine. What's for breakfast, old king? I don't understand all about the Bible, but I believe it all. I believe everything about it. I don't have all the answers in the Bible. You know, somebody said, Where'd Cain get his wife? Well, I don't know where Cain got his wife, and I don't care. If, listen, if, if Cain was happy with her, I'm happy with her. It don't make any difference to me. As an 18-year-old boy, I went away to school, and the first time I walked into a Bible classroom, the professor got up and he said, young men and ladies, anybody who says the Bible is not filled with errors is a fool. And it rocked me. And I can well remember going out to a garden area one day there in that city and getting down on my knees with my Bible. And I said, Lord, I don't know a lot about the Bible. And I'm not as smart, and I'll never be as smart as these men are, but I've been taught to believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And, Lord, I'm going to just hold on to the book. I'm going to believe that it's all inspired of God. Ladies and gentlemen, that's been over 46 years ago. I'm here to tell you tonight, I know the Bible was sent from God, the old as well as the new, divinely inspired the whole way through. I know the Bible is true. He takes us to the counseling room and shows us the intention of the Bible. He takes us to the classroom and he shows us the inspiration of the Bible. And, and then he takes us to the crisis room and he shows us the implications of the Bible. You see, what you believe about its intention and what you believe about its inspiration will have implications in your life and in your ministry if you're a preacher. And that's why when you get to the first verse... Uh, of the cha fourth chapter, he says, I charge thee therefore, you see, now he's making some applications. He's drawing some implications. And, and for just a moment, I want to tiptoe through the verses. I don't have the time to touch on all of them. But ladies and gentlemen, what you believe about the Bible has implications for your preaching. If you are a preacher, it has implications for your preaching. God said to the young Timothy through the old preacher Paul, preach the Word. And he said to it, preach it faithfully. You're standing before the Lord. You'll give an account one day. Preach it incessantly in season and out of season. Preach it effectively. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Preach it 
continually when they want to hear it and when they don't want to hear it. Now, you know, preaching is central to the worship of the church. The central act of worship is the proclamation of the Word in a New Testament church. That's what it's all about. You know, in the average Baptist church on a Sunday morning, I'm so thankful for this, in the average Baptist church on a Sunday morning you walk in, you will find a Baptist preacher with a Bible in his hand and from the top of his head and the bottom of his heart and the top of his lungs, he'll be preaching the Word. You heard about the old boy that preached pretty good on Sunday. And the next morning, he and his wife were having that extra cup of coffee. And he leaned back in the chair. He said, you know, sugar. He said, you know, there are just not many great preachers in this, left in this world, are there? And she said, no, darling, and there's one less than you think there is. <laughs> Preach the word. Now we're told today that you've got to do it different. We're told you can't preach the Word today. You've you got to do something else to get people to come. Uh, that the preaching of the Word is passe. Uh, that the preaching of the Word uh, uh, won't fit into the culture. That we, you, you just can't get up in a pulpit like this and, and just sing a little singing and, and then somebody get up and just preach. You just can't do that anymore. And the latest thing we got going now is this interpretive movement. Now, now, in Baptist circles, that's dancing. That's what we call that. That's dancing. And like one, one uh, scholar said, one Baptist scholar said, a dancing foot don't go on no praying knee. But now we've got interpretive dancing. I got to thinking about that, Brother Rodney. I, I thought, you know, that's what I need to get into to get me a crowd. I... You know, we're not running but about 4,000 on Sunday night. I, I got to do something. We're, we're dying. Maybe I can get into interpretive dancing. I can see it now. But uh, but it, it won't work. You, you, you can't build a church. You know, the, uh, the church growth movement came along. And, and you know, there, there's much to applaud about the church go, growth movement, and there's much of it, but that's good. I, I mean, you, who of us, pastors, you know, not a one of us don't want to grow a church. I mean, really, you know. You heard about the old boy in your pulpit committee came to see him and said, we're looking for a pastor that'll stay with us a while. Our pastors haven't stayed too long and we want somebody to stay with us a while. He said, I'm just the man you're looking for. He said, I've had two churches and I stayed with both of them until they died. <laughs> you know, one old boy, one old pastor said, he said, you know, the church I got right now is dying slower than any church I ever had. Now, you know, we all believe in getting a crowd. We, we, you know, all of us want a crowd. But ladies and gentlemen, there's a difference between a crowd and a church. Oh, yeah, we got some squirrely stuff going on today. Dr. Moeller took me in Louisville, Kentucky by a church a, a few years ago. This is true. I saw it with my eyes. I, I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it. He took me by a church that had a sign out front that said, Express Worship in and out in 20 minutes. You know what we've got going today? We've got what I call church light. It is the church of the 7.5% tithe, the 15-minute sermon, eight commandments, and you get to pick them. It is church light. It's everything you ever wanted in a church and less. Preach the Word! Preach the Word! Oh, but you can't do that. You know, you can't talk about sin. You'll run folks off. I mean, man, you offend people. I never have understood that. You know, where are you going to run them? Hell number one, hell number two. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, and you can't, you know, you can't preach on the blood 
and, and all of that, and you can't preach on judgment and none of that, you know, you'll offend modern sensibilities. Uh, uh, you, know, they, it'll, they, you know, you'll turn their stomachs, you know. And you, you, you know, I, 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 the Lord led me to preach a series of sermons through the minor prophets last year. And I went into it with fear and trembling. You were here one night, Charles. First good sermon you'd heard in three months, wasn't it? <laughs> And I, I said, Lord, I said, what am I going to do? You, you've led me to preach on these minor prophets. I said, nobody will like it. Listen, do you know who I found out liked it better than anybody else? It's these kids sitting right over here. They just ate the minor prophets. Did you like it when I preached on the minor prophets? Yes, sir, you did, brother. They ate it up. I, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you the word will work. Preach the word. Preach the word. Preach the word. There is a difference between building a crowd and building a church. Now... I'm for building a crowd. I am. I'm for building, you know, one guy said about me up in Georgia a number of years ago, he said, oh, Vines, he said, Vines would baptize a monkey if he could get him into the baptistry. <laughs> and come to think of it, I think I have baptized a few monkeys. <laughs> and, uh, and more than one turkey. And a few donkeys along the way, too. <laughs> Preach the Word! Preach the Word! It'll still work, ladies and gentlemen. You see, the argument when I came along... You see, we, we've got a new thief. When I first preached this sermon, the old thief was destructive criticism. Now, today, what we have is a new thief, and he came right out of the house. Acts chapter 20, the Bible says, Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things. I call it the conservative cop-out. Now, you won't find any self-respecting Southern Baptist preacher today who will not say, I believe in the absolute inerrancy, infallibility of the Word of God. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, it is one thing to say you believe the Bible. It is another thing to preach the Bible. Now I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you a question. Now think with me a moment. What's the difference between a liberal who says he does not believe the Bible and doesn't preach it and a conservative who says he does believe the Bible and doesn't preach it? The practical result is the same. How shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear except there be a preacher? It has preaching implications. It has witnessing implications. Did you notice what he said down in verse 5? In verse 5, he said, do the work of an evangelist. Not all of us are called with the gift of the evangelist, but all of us are doing the work of the evangelist. But you see, dear one, if you don't believe in the Bible, if you don't have confidence in the Bible, you're out of the business when you get into the home of a lost person. I mean, go with me a, well, a moment right here in the city of Jacksonville into a little home in a neighborhood. And you walk in there, and, and, and the, the carpet is smelly, and beer cans are scattered all around the room. And there sits a man who is battling with alcohol, and, and his uh, son is on drugs, and his, his daughter is, is expected out of wedlock. And you sit there, and you say, I better not tell him Romans 3.23, I'll offend him. And you say, I better not tell him Jesus died on the cross, that might upset him. And, and you just say to him, would you like to come to church and join our basket weaving class? <laughs> and he says, no, but... Uh, if you could give me the phone numbers for AA and drug rehab and the abortion clinic, I'd like to have it. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't believe the Bible, you're out of business when it comes to winning people to Christ. It has preaching implications. It has witnessing implications. And quickly, it has leaving implications. You see, Paul becomes, gets to be uh, eschatological in these verses. Not eschatological in terms of prophecy, but personally. Because in verse 6 he says, I am now ready to be offered the time of my departures at hand. He's getting ready to leave. Now what would a man want when he's come to the end of the road? When he's getting ready to depart from this world into the next world, what does he want for his leaving? Look at verse 13. The cloak I left 
at Troas with Carpus when you come bring with you and the books but especially the apartments he said bring the cloak that's something warm for his body bring with you that's some fellowship for his soul and then he says and the books that's uh, something for his intellect but then he says especially the parchments the scriptures for his soul some of you may have noticed that um, there's a face missing in our choir many of you knew and loved Miss Pearl Washington Miss Pearl 86 years of age I conducted her funeral on Tuesday and the choir sang and we had a sweet service and I used Psalm 23 verse 4 yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I'll fear no evil for thou art with me and you know I saw that verse from God's Word do what I've seen verses do over and over again I saw it reach out its arms and brush away the tears and I saw it tender and touch and mend broken hearts a man was critically ill and called for his pastor the pastor came and he said would you like for me to read from the Bible and have prayer with you before I go and he said sure and he asked his wife if she'd go get the Bible. And she came back with a shamefully mutilated Bible. And the man, the pastor said, well, what's wrong with your Bible? It's just so mutilated. He said, well, you know, pastor said, when you came to our church, I had a whole Bible. But you taught us that some of the stories in the Bible weren't true. And I'd come home and I'd tear those out of my Bible. And... and, and and pastor you told us that some of those verses we couldn't believe and some of those chapters weren't correct and I'd come home and, and pastor all I've got left is this Bible ladies and gentlemen when you get ready to cross over I want to ask you a question which would you like to have Though its cover is worn and its pages are torn, and though places bear traces of tears, yet more precious than gold is this, is this book, worn and old, that can shatter and scatter our fears. When I prayerfully look in this precious old book, many pleasures and treasures I see, many tokens of love from the Father above, who is nearest and dearest to me. This old book is my guide. It's a friend by my side. It will lighten and brighten my way. And each promise I find, as I prayerfully look, will brighten and lighten my day. I want us to bow our heads in prayer. You agree about Do you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior? The purpose of the Bible is that you might be made wise unto salvation. You say to me, Pastor, I've never received Christ as my Savior. I'm not sure I've been saved. Could I lead you in a simple prayer? And if you mean this prayer in your heart, God would hear you. Would you pray this prayer after me? Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and save me right now. I give my life to you, and I will live for you. Did you pray that prayer? You say, I did. Did you mean it in your heart? You say, Pastor, I did. The Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you pray that prayer in a moment, our choir is going to sing an invitation hymn, Come to Jesus. Our ministers will be standing here. Folks will be praying for you all over the building. I want you to get up, step into that nearest aisle, and come forward and tell the person who receives you, I pray that prayer with the preacher. If you're in the balcony, the stairs on the sides lead down here, downstairs. Every aisle leads to the front. Maybe you have accepted Jesus on some other occasion, and you'd like to make it public this evening. You just come and say, I'm coming to make my public profession of faith in the Lord. Maybe you'd like to be a member of our church. You feel this is where God wants you to go to church. Just come and say, I want to join the church, and they will take care 
of all the details. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, the choir singing. Our ministers are in their places. Folks are praying for you. If you're with someone who needs to come, why don't you offer to walk down the aisle with them tonight?